Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to come to Glasgow. Remotely, of course. Um, so it has been a lovely day so far. Um, so today I'm going to like to talk about something slightly different, but of course related. So I would rather talk about, instead of talking about representations, I would like to tell you about two representations. And something I got hooked up with, whatever, uh, two or three years ago, um, basically how to classify and whatever, classify two representations of, of certain nice categories, um, like, like the, the bimodules, which are categorical analogs of hacker algebra. So I plan to give this talk uh, last year, actually, um, at the very same conference, which was consult, and the talk would have been different because we had a recent breakthrough and now we have a complete classification, basically. That's what I'm going to explain without getting too much into technical details because I know I think most of you are not super familiar with uh, true representation theory, so I'm, I'm taking it very slow today um, and we will see lots of examples. Oops. So, um, so basically what, what I'm going to explain is well, I will start with some Coxeter system. And if you don't know what a Coxeter system is, you can think about the symmetric group, that's perfectly fine. And from such a Coxeter system, you can cook up two different things, which are very much related. One of them is the categorification of the other. So on my right hand side is the categorification, and on my left hand side is kind of the classical picture. And um, the things I would like to construct, or which people have constructed a long time ago, are a hacker algebra attached to that Coxeter system. Again, think of the symmetric group as a quantization of the symmetric group. It's the one that turns up in whatever, a construction of, of link polynomials and so on. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, you have its categorification, and that's what people call Zergel bimodules, or the hacker category. Um, there are also some other different names which I'm not going to use. So I, I would probably will stick with the hacker algebra and the hacker category because then it's kind of clear which one is the categorification. And associated to both, you have again uh, comparable data. On the one hand side, you have the Castellustic basis, the famous Castellustic basis, which has some very miraculous properties, which are very nicely explained by just saying, okay, they are just the the Grotten deep characters of indecomposable objects in my hacker category on the right hand side. So up to this point, which is roughly whatever, two thirds of my slide, um, this is kind of a well understood story, which goes back to at least whatever, the beginning of the 90s when, when Zorgel started to um, think about Zorgel bimodules. And what I would like to do is, I would like to, well, go one step further. Uh, as Katarina explained today, um, linear representations are something interesting, so if you have some, some interesting algebra, like the Hecker algebra, you would like to study its, its linear representations. And um, what you would like to do is you would like to write down a periodic table of simple modules. Right? The symbols are the elements of the theory, so you would like to write down a periodic table. And the main input I'm going to explain today, uh, which actually categorifies, is uh, Kassanus-Vick Dell theory and some type of an asymptotic limit. So kind of a crystal basis for, for hacker algebra. And on the other side, you do exactly the same, and what you get out is uh, uh, technically much more involved, of course, the proofs are much more trickier, much trickier, um, but basically it's the same story, and you get out the parametrization of, 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 two, of, of two symbols, of the analog of simple representations um, of, of hacker algebra. They are analogs, they're called two simple representations or simple transitive two representations of the hacker category. So that's kind of the story I would like to explain. Um, so let me get started, the other way around. Um, so without going too much into details, I, I kind of think most people here know what hacker algebras are. If not, it actually doesn't matter. So let me just try to explain what's going on. So you start with a, with a Coxeter group. Um, for most things I'm going to say, I don't really care. If, like Any Coxeter group would be fine. For some of the results, I would like to stick to finite Coxeter groups, so I just decided to, to stick to finite Coxeter groups from the beginning. So again, what is a finite Coxeter group? Uh, the examples to keep in mind are symmetric groups, like, like this one, and um, other type of groups, there are vile groups, 
um, or more exceptional type of Coxeter groups which arise from um, the symmetry groups of uh, regular polytops, like the symmetry group of the isocahedron is actually um, the corresponding, or the dodecahedron dually is actually the corresponding Coxeter group of type H3. And they have this very nice um, geometric and uh, geometric motivated generator and relation presentation, which is in the middle of my slide, illustrated for the Coxeter group of uh, type B3. And it's basically, um, the, the group is generated by reflections, SI equals one and some Braid relations. And the Braid relations arise by um, basically in the following way, as you can see in the middle of my slide. So you have your regular polytop. So the easiest three dimensional regular polytop I can at least imagine would be the cube. And um, the Coxeter group has three generators, which I call S, T, and U. So S, S1, S2, S3. And it works as follows, and you will immediately see that this generalizes to basically any regular polytop. So you fix a flag in your, in your regular polytop. So my flag here is the green, uh, red, the green dot, the red line, and the whatever, purple-ish um, facet. That's exactly what a flag is, right? A zero-dimensional thing and a one-dimensional thing and a two-dimensional thing. And um, uh, the corresponding generating elements will be given by reflecting uh, along this flag in the following way. So one of them will fix everything uh, of the flag, except it will exchange the zero cells. One of them, so the, the neighboring zero cells, one of them will exchange the neighboring two cells and fix the rest, and the last one will exchange the neighboring uh, one cells, and the last one will exchange the neighboring two cells and fix the rest. And this is a general procedure which generalizes to, um, to, to basically to all Coxeter groups. And this is how Coxeter thought about it, actually. So that's, that's why he came up with this um, definition of, of Coxeter groups, and he tried to classify kind of the, the, those finite reflections. And the story that started a bit later, it's a little bit hard to track down in the formulation I would like to take, is um, you, it, it's, it was certainly already there in the 60s and 70s, uh, that you take kind, kind of deformation of it and you obtain the hacker algebra, which is a deformation of the group ring. And it, it's not like, so you just throw in a deformation parameter V and it's inverse, and basically you deform the, the S squared equals one relation and leave the, um, the break relations are untouched. I'm not going to write down the definition. It doesn't matter so much. The point is it's an algebra defined over this, this ring. And what you certainly can't do naively from this definition is um, to specialize. So you can specialize V to anything, basically, um, except zero. And um, the point will be that the, this precise classification I'm asking for will be given by specializing V to zero. Okay, that's kind of the setup. There's a nice class of algebras, hacker algebras associated to Coxeter groups. Uh, they are defined using a, a parameter, and we would like to classify the simple modules. And I'm going to explain how that works. So, and this is an idea that goes back to Lustig uh, about, let's say, oh gosh, 30 years by now, um, maybe even more. Um, and basically, what he said explains is the following. There is this Kastanustik basis, which I'm not going to write down. I would rather give you an example. It's always a little bit tricky to write down because in the end, it, these are indecomposables in a, in a complicated category. So they are not easy to write down. But they exist, very nice, that's the only thing I need. And from the Kastanustik basis, you can cook up what is called cell theory. And that's a very easy idea. So you have your basis and um, just fix one basis element and you can multiply it with all the other basis elements. And of course you can express that in terms of the basis elements, right? You have just writing down the structure constants in terms of the basis elements. And the cells are kind of defined by um, basis element times another basis element gives you the sum of basis elements and you collect the terms that, that are non-zero and they end up in higher cells. Basically that's the definition. Um, so you have, I'll show you an example in a second. You have cells, you have a cell order coming in the cell. And then Lustig says the following. So that was known end of the 70s, Kastner and Lustig's paper already. And then Lustig says the following. To each simple module of, of the hacker algebra, he associates a maximal two-sided cell, which he calls an apex, which um, he calls an apex. Um, 
And this is maximal in this funny order with respect to the castellustic basis not killing it. Okay? So the castellustic basis is ordered by those. This is cell order. And we have a simple module, the castellustic basis would act on the simple module. And you can ask very naively, when is, is my simple module annihilated by castellustic basis elements? And it turns out that this um, is constant on a cell. So if it is annihilated by one castellustic basis element in, in a cell, it's annihilated by all of them. So you get this nice um, kind of invariant of your, of your simple module given by cells. So to each, to each simple module, you have an associated invariant, which you call an apex, the, the biggest one that, where you still have a non-zero action. And then he goes one step further, and he says, OK, to each such cell, he associates a, a semi-simple algebra. So Z semi-simple means it is a matrix ring. And in order to get the, really its matrix form, you only need a base change, which works integrally, which is a really rare property. So this is super semi-simple in some, in some sense. And to each such j, he associates such this algebra aj, which he calls asymptotic algebra. It's a bit tricky to define. I won't do that. I will tell you what the categorification is. But basically, it's a v to 0 limit of, uh, of the hacker algebra. Basically, it's a crystal associated to the hacker algebra. Remember, the v equals 0 is the only parameter that you can't uh, well plot into v, because we have v inverse. Well, strictly speaking, there's v infinity equals infinity as well, but it's kind of do it anyway. And this is kind of the crystal. And then his theorem says, and the, this basically works for any Coxeter group. So the equivalence class of those simples, which are now ordered by the invariant called the apex, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with equivalence classes of the simples associated to, uh, to this asymptotic algebra. And the asymptotic algebra is just ridiculously simple in some sense. It's much easier. It's, it's a matrix algebra. So you basically just need to count. You just make, have to make sure that you understand what aj is. And the main takeaway today will be a categorification of this. But basically a one-to-one -one categorification of the very same statement. But before we go to the categorical level, let me, let me give you an example. OK. Um, so the Coxeter group associated to the square is, uh, sorry, the, the symmetry group associated to the square is a type B2 hacker algebra. And this is my example. It's very easy. Uh, this is a generator in relation presentation. So you have two generators, which I call S and T. And you have the order four great relations. So T, S, T, S equals S, T, S, T. Which is, by the way, very nice to see if you, if you really would draw those, um, those, re draw those reflections and, and look at how they act on a, on a Joseph Black. Um, so this is a 90 degree case. In a 90 degree case, you always get an order four, uh, four, four term relation. And in this case, it's also relatively easy to write down the custom basis. basis. Um, so it, it ignores the zero here. The zero is certainly a typo. But it basically is, is follows. You take a certain power of v that doesn't matter at all in this context. Um, and then for w0, which is the longest word, which is stst, you just write down the sum of all sub-expressions. Uh, so 1 plus s, so everything for the longest word. For s, the only two sub-expressions would be s and 1. You write them down, and you take the sum of them. For st, you would have um, oh, uh, 1, st, and st, for example, and so on. And um, in this case, this is how the, well, you would work it out. You would multiply them. I'll show you a multiplication table in a second. Um, but this basically is the cell structure that you get, and this reads as follows. So each of those numbers or symbols, so 1, S, S, D, or whatever, they actually correspond to a Castanustic basis element, and they are ordered um, from bottom to top. So um, in my notation, the trivial element, this one here, is the lowest, and the longest element is, a, is the biggest. And in the middle, you have this nice cell picture. Um, so the, the big square is the J cell I'm interested in, the two-sided cell. Um, the small, uh, the columns would be left cells, so you can define a, a two-sided order or a left order or a right order, and uh, the rows are right cells, and the small things are intersections of left and right cells, which people sometimes call H cells. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. This is how it looks like. 
and, and this is how it looks like in general of course for your favorite type e8 whatever it gets a little bit more complicated you have more elements but roughly that's the picture um, you get some order and now each symbol has an associated um, apex so it could either be the lowest one it could be the middle one or it could be the top one so let me let me show you an example how this actually works so this is, everything is really explicit so if you think about the Cochster group as um, the reflection group of the, of, of the square, here you go, the two generators, they have exactly this action. And of course, this defines you a representation of the, of the vial group, which quantizes nicely. Um, so it's defining representation. And it's not hard to check that this is a simple, it's a two-dimensional simple representation of, uh, of the type B2 vial group. And what you now would need to check is that um, I claim this is apex being the one in the middle. So what I would, would need to check is that one of these doesn't annihilate it, for example, S, and W0 annihilates it. And it's just a calculation by using those two matrices, right? For example, um, CS is one plus S, so ignore the V, so it's basically one plus S, so it's basically the, the matrix is only made from ones. And if you would do the calculation for, um, for the longest one, you will see it actually does exist zero. And this is how you would define an apex in general, right? So an apex is always, you just check what the, what the uh, matrices actually are in your, uh, in, your, in your representation, and you would do the calculation and, and see that the casualistic basis elements up to a certain point act as non-zero, and from a certain point onward act as zero. And this breaking point is, is where, you, where you pull your line, this is where your apex uh, ends. Okay, so here you have three APCs. Um, um, okay, and it's not hard to see that the associated asymptotic algebras are uh, for the bottom and the top one, there's not much choice, they are, they are just the integers. For the middle one, it's a bit more interesting, so let me show you how it looks like. Um, so the, the above is the multiplication table of this asymptotic algebra, which has basis elements uh, indexed by, I call them A, and they're indexed by the elements in my cell. So those guys, S, S, D, whatever, blah, blah, blah. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that's the multiplication table. And it looks actually already very nice. You don't see any crazy coefficients turning up and it's not hard to see that up to an integral base change, this is just Z plus Z plus two, two by two matrices over Z, which I hope I did the count correct, is uh, six dimensional. And so you now count um, using the theorem performed before, so Z gives you one associated symbol, this other one gives you another symbol, and this one gives you another symbol, because it's just a matrix algebra. But this symbol is a two-dimensional one, the one that I just showed you, uh, so you get three associated symbols in, 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 uh, using uh, Lustig's theorem. And um, how do you get this table? Well, you would need to do the whole calculation using the Gasser-Lustig basis. It just gets a bit already in this case is not so easy as you can see here. Don't look too much at the entries; it doesn't matter so much. Um, the point is, there is a way to make everything positive in V. So you, when you write it down, you never see any V inverses, and you basically just take the V to zero limit of this associated multiplication table, and that's what you get upstairs. Okay, so you can define this asymptotic algebra by doing some, some voodoo on the Kastanustic basis elements and you, you, get an, you, you get a version to take the V to zero limit or you can actually just substitute V equals zero because you don't see any inverses in it. And this asymptotic algebra is basically a matrix algebra in disguise and you just count how many matrix components you have and that's the number of symbols you get. Okay. Um, and then you can use the theorem and you get a classification for simple modules of, of let's say, finite Cox's operator. And it works for any type. Like, if you're a big fan of exceptional type H4, then yeah, you would write down the cell structure in type H4 and you, and you, can, you could play this game. Um, there's a small catch. So in type H4, this AJ is not so easy to compute. So it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a parameterization in the sense that you still need to do some work even if you're already on the on the right hand side it's not like it's not like you get an answer my symbols are indexed by one two three four it's more like you get an answer 
my symbols are indexed by x, and x is a little bit easier than the problem you just started with. It's a parameter relation in, in that sense. Um, anyway, the nice thing is on the categorical level, it actually gets better. So it's, it, it's basically the same theorem, um, but, but without any catch, basically, which is very surprising. So this is basically the only time I can tell you about a categorification of a classical theorem where the categorification is actually easier than the classical theorem itself. Okay, so um, I'm going to the categorical level now. So let me just summarize what we have seen. So simples, basically the, the middle of my slide is a summary. So simples of the, um, of the hacker algebra have an, uh, have an uh, invariant quality apex and for a given apex, you can classify them using, using the, the V equals zero limit of the hacker algebra. Okay. Um, if you don't know what a, what true representation theory is, here's basically the picture you should keep in mind. I will give you an explicit example in a second, but um, a, basically a two module or a true representation is a categorification of a module. And secretly you have a two category, like an algebra is secretly a one category where you can whatever, take your, um, uh, take your uh, whatever primitive idempotence and split it in some idempotent inversion, for example. Um, so secretly, actually, representation theory is uh, is writing down a functor. Um, so two representation theory is writing down a two functor, which means to each object in your category you associate associate a category instead of a vector space because a category category has vector spaces, and to each morphism in your category you associate a functor instead of a linear map because a functor category has a linear. Map. And for the natural transformation, you just have don't, don't have any analog downstairs. So it's kind of this, this reverse stack is whatever it is. So that's kind of the idea. And on the categorical level, you should see more structure and categorifications are nice. We have seen that, for example, in Katarina's talk today. Um, they're, just, they're just better than, in some sense, classical representation theory. Maybe I shouldn't say better. They're just richer than classical representation. And the examples to keep in mind is, um, and that's what, what we usually like to study two representations of, are basically monoidal categories, which are two categories with one object. Um, so I'm going to switch to monoidal categories in a second. So if you don't like two categories, the monoidal categories is perfectly fine. Um, module categories over finite groups, that's a good example. Finite group is a Hopf algebra, so mo the module categories are, um, um, uh, monoidal categories, and the only reason I want a finite group here is that there will be some hidden finiteness assumptions in what I'm going to say. They are just satisfied for finite groups. Uh, Hopf algebra is more general, uh, modular categories, tensor categories, the circle bimodular category I, I uh, promised to tell you about in the, in the title, um, category fed quantum groups and, and other nonsense. So it's a very rich role. And you all have seen uh, categorical representations at one point in your life. Um, for example, the tilting modules or, or uh, basically the LLT algorithm in some sense is, is a true representation, which you also have seen in Katarina's talk. And there are a lot of uh, two, applica uh, two applications. Yes, there are also two applications of true representation theory, but um, maybe I want to talk about applications of true representation theory. So um, it becomes very popular nowadays in modular representation theory, basically the whole story about um, P-canonical basis originates from the Zergel category acting on, categorically acting on a nice category of tilting modules. And you have uh, applications to link homologies, so you can construct link homologies using, or well, TQFTs using, um, uh, using two representations. Um, just to give you a broad overview. So, the, 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 basically the question I would like to ask for the uh, remaining something like 15 minutes, um, is, well, classically speaking, I guess everyone here in this audience agrees that what you really want to do, the kind of the first non-trivial step, if you have a nice algebra that you like, is you want to write down the periodic table of simple modules, right? The kind of the easiest question you can think of. Um, it's, it's really just a parameterization. That's even easier than writing down the, the, the characters or whatever. So this is really the first and easiest question. And on the two categorical level, you just would like to do the same. So um, there's a notion of a two simple, which is exactly the categorification of a notion of 
and algebra, a simple, a simple module of an algebra has no A stable ideals, so you have no C stable ideals. Remember that my, my C acts by my two angle functions on, on uh, the category. Um, and the analogy is really on the classical level. We have the Jordan Holder theorem, which basically says everything is built out of simple modules, so they're really the elements of my theory. Um, on the categorical level, you have what is called a weak Jordan Holder theorem, which is basically saying the same. There is a slight catch, there comes a weak. So on the categorical level, you have some kind of a freedom to vary home spaces, and those two symbols are kind of the categorifications with the smallest home spaces, the minimal categorification categorifications, and they usually don't turn out turn up directly in a in a Jordan Holder theorem, but as a further sub quotient. So that's what the week is referring to. Um, but it's kind of the best you can hope for because as I said, on the categorical level you always have kind of the freedom to to make home spaces arbitrary big if you want. Um, that's not what the two so the two symbols is kind of the minimal uh, categorification. So um, Find the periodic table of two simples seems to be, for me, at least to me, seems to be a, a reasonable first question I would like to ask. Then you would go on asking more fancy questions like two characters, or can you construct things explicitly, or whatever, right? But if you can't answer the first question, then maybe all hope is lost anyway. So let me try to explain how this works by showing you an example. Um, and just a disclaimer, yeah, I should throw in some words here and there, but let's, let, let, let's ignore that to make everything work. Um, like finiteness that I mentioned. I, I should mention finiteness somehow. Um, but let's, let's do an example. So rep G, so representations, finite dimensional representation of a finite group. That's my monoidal category. And you all know how the monoidal structure looks like. I just have written it down uh, in, the, in, the first, in the second bullet point. And there's a trivial representation of everything. And um, the first two representation you would like to write down is the analog of the regular representation. So the group acts on itself. So um, my category rep G also acts on itself just by tendering. And this defines an endofunctor of the category um, of the category itself. So this is the regular two representation, which really is is a categorification of the regular representation. So um, not too bad, I hope. Right, two representation is just a true functor from C, well, a monoidal functor in this case, from C to NC, and it's given by, by, by tensoring. So the monoidal functor of, of tensoring. Um, okay. But you can do a little bit better. So for any subgroup, pick the subgroup, um, you can uh, write down a true representation, namely rep K. My subgroup is K, and you can write down a true representation rep K, and the functor I'm using now is basically this restriction functor. And the only thing you need to observe is that restriction is actually a tensor functor, so this, all of this makes sense. And um, restriction defines your true representation of rep G on rep K for any subgroup K. Um, the one that I just showed you was kind of the, the, the trivial example, where K was G. Um, and again, these are categorifications of, of nice integral uh, representations of uh, the group. So you, you usually don't categorify whatever complex re simple representations, but you categorify integral representations because in the growth degree, you usually only see integers or natural numbers or whatever. So, but anyway, this is another one. Um, hopefully not too bad. Restricting the action from K to G defines where two representations. And you might think, hmm, are there actually more? Um, and yes, they are a little bit, a, a little bit more because you know, on the categorical level, you can do something to the, to the higher structure, which you can't see downstairs. So downstairs, you would be basically done here. If you would be interested in classifying whatever indecomposable representations over the integers, then th that would be it. There are no further indecomposable representations over the integers except the decategorifications of those. But on the categorical level, you can always twist everything. You can twist the monoidal structure, you can twist the action, you can twist the home spaces, something like that. And you just need to do that in a controlled way. And the way it works here is as follows. So to each uh, two co cycle, that's just a fancy word of saying that, that whatever scalar I want to throw in, it satisfies some nice condition. So this will be a scalar that I would like to throw in here. and um, 
you have a category of projective K modules. What does this mean? Um, well, instead of acting on a vector space, you act on a, on a projective space. That's, that's a projective K module. So a, a representation up to scale. I can, you can twist everything by this thing which is usually called a sure multiplier. And twisting means exactly what you think it is. So um, any representation acts is, is a representation up to a well-defined scalar. Okay, so I just have two inputs, a k and a scalar to twist. A k and a scalar to twist. And of course, if I don't twist, <laughs> it's just the usual one. And you can make sense of a true representation in this context by twisting the action upstairs. Something so you twist your tensor graph. It's something you just can't see uh, on the on the decatur side level. Anyway, um, so you can all of these guys define you a, a true representation of rep G. Um, again, by some restriction process, and the theorem is that these are all, first of all, that's not hard to check, that these are all two simple modules, basically by construction they are, um, but also that all two simples are of this form. That's, that's much harder, and I, I don't have a good reference for it, um, but it's certainly well known for at least 20 years, or 25 years or so, um, and they're all of this form, you have a subgroup, basically what you act on is rep k, but you twist everything with a, with a cosine. And it's also a non-redundant classification in the following sense. So two of them are equivalent. Um, if and only if k and k prime are conjugated subgroups, okay, so it boils down not to classify subgroups, it boils down to classify conjugate, uh, co conjugation class of subgroups. And if a certain condition on the, on the, on the, um, uh, on the sure multiplier is satisfied. Um, and why is this a good classification? Why is this really a good parametrization? Because now it is basically a com 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 computational problem. So instead of having a categorical problem, what on earth can I do? Write down two functors from rep G to basically anything. It seems to be pretty much impossible on the first glance. Uh, this looks much more uh, tractable, right? You just for your given fixed group, you sh should classify um, subgroups up to conjugacy, which still can be really tricky, um, but still it's a, it's, a, um, it's a problem on a different level. So I would call this uh, a good parameterization. This is, this is a good classification theorem because it reduces the complexity to a, to a lower level. Let me show you how those things look like uh, in an example. So um, the examples, the turn up for Zergel bimodules, as we will see in a second, in the next six minutes, are very easy subgroups, so G, S3, S4, S5, and you would write down those tables. Um, so you would write down the, well, let's do rep, uh, S3. So S3 is the small table, S5 is of course the big table. You are not supposed to look at the details in the big table, but basically what I want to say is this is a computational problem. So um, the subgroups of S3 up to conjugacy are the trivial one, S3 itself, not very surprising, and you have a copy of Z mod 2 and you have a copy of Z mod 3. And um, up to conjugacy, they appear exactly one time, right? That's what you would like to count. So you have done your counting problem for, um, for the conjugacy classes. And you would like to, for, for all of them, you need to compute this, this, this cohomology, which might be a bit tricky, but for S3, you certainly find something in gap or something. Someone has computed that before. That's very good. In this case, all of them are trivial, so you can't twist things. For S3, you just can't twist. And um, so we get four simple modules, four simple true representations associated to those, those four uh, classes of, of, of subgroups. And I, I even have written down the ranks of them because they are just um, given by the corresponding uh, representation categories. So Z mod three has, you act on rep Z mod three in this case. So Z mod three has three simple modules. So that's a rank of the corresponding module. S3, as a coincidence, also has three simple modules uh, working well, let's say, the complex numbers, and so the rank is also three. Right? The trivial one has only one simple module, so whatever. You get the point. And this is how it looks like for S5. Uh, whatever. Someone has classified simple subgroups. So it's certainly a reduction of the problem. 
in some sense, instead of worrying about categorical nonsense, now you have to worry about finding the right um, t table of data, say in something like the atlas of finite groups that you've also seen today. N not quite, of course, because you're looking for conjugated classes of subgroups. But you get the point, right? There is some, someone has computed that before and it's not so bad. Okay, so this is a really nice classification theorem and it will turn out that for Zogel binomials, so categorical hacker algebras, the classification problem looks exactly the same, which is a pretty weird and kind of unexpected result. Okay, in the last four minutes, I don't have time to explain Zogel bimodules or those things. So I just list the main properties. Um, so as studied by, by, let's say, those three guys, uh, a lot of people, many else, I should coin many, many more names, I'm so sorry. Um, but basically what they say is there exists a C linear monoidal category. Um, so I really would like to work for C for now. So the classification I'm going to show you is not modular. It's, it's over C, but anyway, uh, it was already hard enough, so I'm very happy. Um, there exists a C linear monoidal category, which basically categorifies uh, the hacker algebra. So for every element in your, in your bile group, uh, sorry, in your Coxeter group, you have an indecomposable object whose character is the uh, customer subject. Um, and classifying two symbols is kind of the categorical kind of analog of classifying uh, symbols of the hacker algebra. And almost the same people, um, but basically Lustig instead of Zergel, um, they also have a, have a categorification of this other algebra of the asymptotic limit. It's exactly the same statement. Okay, so you don't even need to read the bullet points for each blah, there exists an object which is now a simple object because that's the whole point. This is a semi-simple category. So the easiest type of category in this context you could, you, you could imagine that, that, that appears. Uh, so the simple objects, not the indecomposable ones, the simple ones, which are the indecomposable ones because it's semi-simple. Anyway, those categorify this, uh, this, this asymptotic limit. And actually, the way you construct it is you realize that Zogel bimodules are positively graded and this AJ is a degree zero part. Okay, so Lustig theorem in this sense is just saying um, you get a classification, you have a positively graded algebra and you get a classification of simples by looking at the degree zero part. That's basically what it boils down to in the end. Um, okay, I'm almost done. On the categorical level, I just show you the, the final statement and then I'm done. So uh, the theorem, which we proved at the beginning of this year, so as I said, I would, would actually wanted to talk about this last year, but last year the theorem was, had a lot of catches here and there, and, but now it's very smooth and very nice. So um, actually it's even better because you don't have to study, study all of AJ, there's an even smaller semi-simple monoidal subcategory, and you get basically the same statement as before. So equivalence classes, with a certain apex, that's the same notion of apex. Um, I want to one to one with the equivalence classes of the semi-simple thing, right? On the, remember, on the decategorified level, you have the hacker algebra, which over the integers is certainly not semi-simple, and you have the semi-simple thing on the other side, and you had a parameterization of simples, uh, a bijection of simples, and here it's the same. And it turns out that the problem that we can't compute AJ in general is kind of solved because here we have to compute a smaller thing, which is a H. And um, in almost all examples, for example, in vial type, it's almost always of the form rep G, um, up to three exceptions. The, the, the three exceptions in an infinite number of, of cases, right? So that, that's not too bad. And even in those three exceptions, I could write down little representation. So this is really a, a complete classification of, of simple modules because you reduce it to a known problem of uh, classifying, basically classifying two representations of that. Okay, so that's the takeaway methods, degree zero gives, taking degree zero part, taking the, whatever, the asymptotic limit, gives kind of this, this nice classification of parameterization of simples. And for the hacker category, it's actually even better because you don't have to compute the whole thing, you, so the big east, you can, there's a smaller one, and you can just stick for, 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 for this one, just do the calculation for this one, and the small one is always something well known, up to some, something like three exceptions in, 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 in an infinite number of times. 
So it basically gives you a, a, a complete classification of simples and categorifies Lustig's original um, classification theorem from, from the bit of theory. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you.